Amen. Amen. Please turn to Psalm 15b. We're in Psalm 15. Psalm 15 in the blue books. And it's exactly the same as Psalm 15a. It's the same tune, it's just the tune is slightly more rhythmic in 15b. Within thy tabernacle, Lord, who shall abide with thee? And in thy high and holy hill, who shall a dweller be? And so we can stand to sing. We'll sing the whole of the psalm, uh, 15b. Let's stand to sing. Within thy tabernacle, Lord, who shall abide with thee? And in thy high... Let us open our scriptures to Psalm 15 and read the words. The words we've just sung. Psalm 15. Hello there. A psalm of... David. So reading from Psalm 15 in the Bible, a psalm of David. And reading from the verse number one, Psalm 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue nor doeth evil to his neighbor nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. 
He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. Amen. As we've already made mention of uh, previously, that in Colossians, the letter, the epistle to the Colossians, that Apostle Paul makes mention uh, of the whole book of Psalms being the songs of Christ in Colossians 3 and verse 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So it's not only true when we hear that expression, the word of Christ, and then connected to the, uh, to the scriptural hymn book. So it's not just that they, they are written by the Spirit of Christ through the various uh, prophets, the prophetic authors that we have as the authors, the human authors, the penmen of the Scriptures. Not only that, it is not just the Spirit of Christ working through them, it is that, but not only. Uh, we also have the fact that these Psalms speak much about Christ Himself. And, and sometimes Christ is not quite as clear uh, embodied in the Psalms, the, the 15 or the 14 that we've looked at already. In some places, in some Psalms, Christ is very evident, very clear. Uh, he is there in the Psalm. He is there spoken to, prayed to in the Psalm sometimes embodied in the person who wrote the psalm. And again, in Psalm 15, we see a glimpse of Christ, more than a glimpse of Christ. In fact, we could say Psalm 15 describes Christ. It is a picture of Christ, but not only a picture of Christ. It is also a picture of those who are by faith united to Christ. And so we understand that when we consider what a Christian is, that we have even the name of Christ in Christian, that we are, to, we are to grow in the likeness of Christ. That is the very point of, of the Christian life. Yes, to become a Christian, the point of that is to be saved from our sins, to be forgiven of our sins, to have peace with God. But then there's a life that goes on afterwards preparing us for eternal glory, and that is, a, that is a, a lifetime of restoring the image of God lost in the fall that we would call the image of Christ. And so, with the Lord's gracious help this evening, let us look a little bit at a picture of Christ and of those united with Him. A picture of Christ and of those united with Him. And as we open up the first verse, we see firstly the eternal question, the eternal question before us, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? It's firstly then pointing us to a heavenly home, the hope that every believer has. We're directed then uh, to consider the eternal dwelling place of the redeemed where we will yet be at death when our bodies dies, die and, and we go to be in glory with the Lord. That is pointed to here most definitely that when we die, that we who are found in the Lord have had our souls washed in the blood, have a home in heaven, have a place prepared for us as the Lord himself says in the beginning of John chapter 14, be not troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. And he continues that he goes uh, to, ma to make a place for them in my Father's house. There are many mansions, and he prepares a place for those who will abide in his tabernacle, who shall dwell in his holy hill. Again, the Hebrew, Hebrew parallelism we see there, saying almost the same thing in two different ways, and they fill each other's lack, as it were. 
The tabernacle of God is in the heavenly Zion, of course. The tabernacle of God, the true tabernacle, because the tabernacle that was given to Moses, the, the blueprints, the, 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 the design that was given to him was merely a reflection of the heavenly. There was a heavenly tabernacle there, because they a heavenly temple. <coughs> a heavenly dwelling place for the Lord, for the angels, for the, uh, for the elders uh, of, the, of the Old and the New Testament church, for all the people of God, that place that we can go to be with the Lord, who shall abide with the Lord, who will live with the Lord, who will continue to have an eternal dwelling with the Lord, well, it will be in heaven. You say, well, there is a resurrection, surely. There will be a resurrection of the bodies. Yes, there will be. And those souls will be reunited with the bodies, and then we will dwell in a new heaven and a new earth, a renewed heaven, a renewed earth, and, and we understand from the scriptures that the, the universe that we have before us will be rolled up like a scroll, and that as, that, as it were, will bring heaven upon earth because God will dwell for eternity with his people. We will tabernacle with the Lord Jesus Christ in bodies that can touch him and can feel him, that we could say with John in 1 John that we, we beheld him who is the word of life, and we will behold him, we will touch him, we will see him, we will rejoice in his presence, and he will rejoice in ours, his prayer being fully answered, that we will be where he is. So he has a home for our souls, but he also has an eternal home for our body and soul to be with him, and where he is, is home. Wherever we live on this earth, whatever circumstance there is in the life of the believer, whether we're in the deepest of the, of the, the darkest valley, or we're in, on the highest of the mountains, but we should surely know this, that our truest friend on our best home is not in Calgary. It is not wherever it might, it might be in some day but it is with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that. We know that especially when the Lord brings difficulties into our lives that we would get on our knees, that we would call upon Him, and then we know that we're home. Although wherever we're kneeling at that time, whether it's in a hospital, whether it's in our bedroom, whether it's on public transport, whatever it might be, but we're calling upon the Lord, and we know we're home. He's hearing us. He's looking at us. He's protecting us. And that one day, that truth will be a permanent one, yet without any tears, without any sicknesses, without any death, because our Lord will have conquered them all forever and ever. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Speaking of a heavenly home, but he's also making it clear in that question that this heavenly home is not for everyone. It's not for everyone. So who is... That's the question, who shall abide? Who shall dwell? Well, only those is that we will see in the remainder of the remainder of the psalm. It's answered in the remainder of the psalm, and we, we will look at those, at those uh, characteristics when we come to them. So it's only for those that display the fruits of repentance. It's only those that lead a sanctified life, a changed life, a new life in Jesus. It's the evidence, it's what the, the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament, maybe more emphasis in the New Testament, that, the, that there is fruit to be shown in the life of the believer. Not that they are perfect, but there is fruit. A tree, you consider a tree, and a tree uh, can have twisted limbs, a, a tree can have weeping sores, a tree can be under attack from, from fungal growth, and whatever, and yet it is the fruit that the Lord points us to. He doesn't point us towards the, the girth of the tree or the height of the tree, the strength of the tree, how clear the bark and how healthy the bark is. He says, no, look at the fruit. By their fruit ye shall know them. And that is what we understand then. It's those that are bearing fruit, are bearing the marks of the grace of Jesus Christ in their lives. Not, again, how nice the tree looks, but it is a tree that bears fruit because the Lord desires fruit. 
And so in some ways here, he describes the, tr the fruit as we will come into the remainder of the psalm. But we notice also this, that he exhorts to fruit. He exhorts us, he commands us, he encourages us to bear fruit because we know when a tree does not bear fruit, what does the Lord say? And he's very strict, he's very clear upon this, then the tree will be chopped down. If it bears not fruit, we know the long suffering of the Lord, that he will, he will dig around it, he will put manure around it, he will, he will give it all the food that it needs, and now we're talking about the means of grace, that it would bear fruit that there would be repentance, that there would be a change of life, that there would be newness of life. But there will come a day when there is no fruit and the Lord says, well, that tree is to be chopped down. How that is, is that by excommunication? Is that by hardened of sin and leaving the means of grace, never returning? Is that at death, any of those three and maybe more? So we see it's not for everyone. Not everyone will dwell in the Lord's holy hill. Not everyone will dwell in Mount Zion, the heavenly truth, the heavenly true Mount Zion, but only those who by God's grace have been drawn to it and drawn to Christ. So that's the eternal question that's very much a part of the gospel, uh, that we are lost in sin and we have but one Savior, and a mighty and a sufficient Savior He is, and we must have Him for our Savior, lest we be not saved, lest we die in our sin. So there is only one way of abiding in the tabernacle of God, and that's to, that's to make peace with God, God's way. And who is God's way? Jesus, the way, the truth and the life. The eternal question, an important question uh, to be answered. But secondly then, I'd like us to look at the description of Christ that we see here. The description of Christ that we see in verses 2 to 5. The remainder, we will look at these in a more, in a more practical manner in the last uh, of these. No, 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 no. there but everyone's okay I trust
then um, with our examination of Psalm 15. So we saw firstly in Psalm 15 in the first verse, which is, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Uh, we saw something of the eternal question. Uh, and then we move on as we look at the remainder of the psalm to see something of the description of Christ that's in this psalm. And there are many attributes of Jesus Christ that are revealed to us in Psalm 15, and they truly describe his perfections. For only Christ was ever able to fully keep the moral law perfectly. Uh, and these attributes, they describe his holy character. They describe the goodness of the Lord Jesus. They describe the purity of the Lord Jesus. Uh, and they show also, not only does it describe his holy character, but he is also this great example to his people when we consider who he is. But also this, the purity of his propitiation, the purity of him as a sacrifice for sin. That's the expiation, the propitiation, the sacrifice against wrath that we see here. So just briefly then, uh, we will look just some more deeply at these uh, attributes in a more practical way in our third point. But now in our second point, it says a number of things there in verse 2, 3, 4, and 5. Firstly, it declares that the Lord Jesus Christ is righteous. He's righteous. Jesus Christ walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart through and through righteous. Through and through he is good. He is, when we think of righteous, we can think of true righteousness. It's not the righteousness that believers have. The righteousness that, that we have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ attributed to us. We, we receive it in our name. Uh, so we only obtain his righteousness by faith, but he has true righteousness. And a very simple way that I've often used in family worship with the children to understand what righteousness is, and I've said it from the pulpit maybe once or twice, which is not enough, it is saying that which is right. In fact, we can go deep in, desiring that which is right, thinking that which is right, saying that which is right, doing that which is right. Every part of you, body and soul, desires and does that which is right all the time. The, the exact opposite of the Lord's description of, of mankind that we know in Genesis uh, 6 and verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, we have the Lord Jesus Christ as the exact opposite of that. We could say, and God saw that the holiness of Jesus was great upon the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only holy continually, only pure, only good, only kind, merciful, gracious. And he is all of those things. He is righteous because he has never committed any sin because he is impeccable impeccable. And that is just, that does not mean that he is sinless. It means he is sinless because he is unable to sin. Absolutely contrast, in, absolutely um, in stark contrast to our own nature, his nature is pure. It is sinless. He's unable to sin. It is a, against his holy nature. Unable to sin cannot sin, and therefore he never did sin. It is the impeccability of Jesus Christ that is so wonderful, so glorious. To think of ourselves that we can so easily, being sinful, we can so easily be led astray into the sinful behavior of others. Uh, we see that in, in the entertainment industry, in music, even at school or colleges, or even colleagues that can, that can encourage us to do things that we shouldn't do. But Christ was never influenced. 
because it did not come up in him. It, it did, he had no desire for sin. He was unsinnable. And connected with that that we see there, at the, towards the end of verse 2, and speaketh the truth in his heart. Christ does not lie. He does not lie. He, again, he cannot lie because of his impeccability. He cannot lie. He does not desire to lie. A lie is abhorrent to him. It is filthy to him. And it is, it is who he says that he is. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and the life. There is only truth in the Lord Jesus Christ being impeccable, being perfectly impeccable. And then we see there in verse 3 again, he that backbiteth, backbiteth not. Christ is no gossip. Christ is no slanderer. Christ is no despiser. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Here we see what is so common in the world, so common in humanity. Backbiting, doing evil, taking up a reproach, being argumentative, being a modern term, being a Karen whatever the male version is. I have no idea. But this is not Christ. Christ does not backbite. He does not evil to his neighbor. He does not take up a reproach against his neighbor because Christ is loving. And there is none more loving than Jesus Christ. None. We've seen the descriptions of the love of Christ towards his people. We, we know that it, it is an unconditional love, the agape love. It's unconditional, which is a glorious truth because it's not, that, it's not that we would do anything to lose the love once we've become recipients of the love. It's an unconditional love. It is a perfect love, and it goes forth towards his own beloved people without disturbance without fail all day every day the Lord loves his people in fact the opposite of what we see here is not is in in contrast to backbiting and doing evil reproaching against his neighbor what does the Lord Jesus do for his people he ever liveth to make intercession for them he prays for them he blesses them he sends many gifts in his church to them. He speaks to them in his word. He exhorts, encourages, and comforts them, even by his own spirit indwelling his, his people. We could go more into the love of Christ, but just those things that we see there in verse 3. Christ is loving. He's righteous. He's true. He's loving. But we also see that he hates the unrighteous. It says there in verse 4, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. Contemned is an old word meaning despised. And so this is a good thing. In whose eyes, in this godly person, I'm thinking of Christ now, a vile person is despised, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. So we see the hating of the unrighteous, and we, we've seen that already when we opened up Psalm 7. And in verse 11 of Psalm 7, we see that God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. That's what we see very clearly, that this Lord is a righteous Lord in the way that he deals with sinners. He draws them to repentance and is a judge to those that will not repent. So he hateth the unrighteous, those that are not found in him, those that are in their sins. And he must hate the unrighteous because he is righteous. Because he is righteous, he hateth the unrighteous. But we see also that he loveth the righteous. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He, he honors them. He loves them. He does them good. The righteous, who are they? They are not the self-righteous legalists. That's not what we're talking of. That's not what the 
That's not what the psalmist is speaking of, not the self-righteous legalist. And those who are on the outside that can be like the Pharisee, and they seem so good and they seem so proper, but on the inside are dead men's bones. No, again, it brings us back to the true meaning of righteousness for humans is those that are justified by faith, and that is whom, uh, who is loved by the Lord Jesus. He loves them who are righteous and were his righteousness, who trust in him he loves and honors. And it says there in the final part of verse 4, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. And this is linked with the fact that he is righteous and he is true. He also keeps his word. He keeps his word. He that sweareth, you, you, you swear to something, is the idea if you make an oath or you make a promise to do something, but you keep it. You do not break your promise. He that sweareth to his own hurt. And that's very true in the name, in, in the sense of Christ. He has made a covenant. He has made a gospel promise with the Father in the covenant of redemption. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost in the covenant of grace made a promise that the people of God would be saved. And who was to save it? Who was to save them? They needed the Redeemer, which brings us back to the Father and the Son in the covenant <coughs> of redemption that they made. See something more of that in Psalm 2. Today thou art my son. And he sends them to, sends him to deal with the unrighteous, but we know that he also sent him to deal with those who would become the righteous. He keeps his word, and it did cost him. He that sweareth to his own hurt. He who became man according to the covenant, the God-man, and he who suffered that life amongst sinners and who went to that cross, having suffered greatly and then to suffer even more upon the cross, he that sweareth uh, to the God of heaven that a he would purchase a people with his own blood, he that sweareth in the gospel covenant to his own hurt and changeth not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't it glorious then to know that when we read the scriptures and we see the Lord Jesus Christ and we hear something of his gospel promises and his warnings, but we think of his promises now, that when he says, all that come to me, I will in no wise cast out, that that gospel promise is as firm and as sure as it was 2,000 years ago. It hasn't weakened in any way. It hasn't crumbled in any way. It is the same promise and the same divine seal is upon it. He changeth not. And he that putteth not out his money to usury, verse uh, 5, we see that he does not exploit the poor. And this is we have that earthly understanding of, of taking advantage or, or misusing people. But the Lord would never take advantage. He's not there to misuse or abuse he can be so trusted with everything. First of all, when you come to him by faith, you, you trust him and trust him with your sin. And he knows the most wicked and vilest of sins that you've committed that you would just want to melt away in your seat if other people knew. And he knows them. He knows them because he is your creator. He knows them most especially because he has put them upon himself as your redeemer. So it's not just a list that he reads through. He bore our sin upon his body or in his body upon the cross. So closely will he identify himself with his people and with their sin that we would be delivered from them. He does not exploit the poor. He helps the poor. He loves the poor in spirit. Which means this, that you can trust him and rely upon him and remember this in your own life where there have been people who have abused you, who have misused you, that, you know, with the Lord Jesus Christ, that is not the case. He does not exploit others. 
but rather he exploited himself. He sacrificed himself. He doesn't sacrifice others for his own benefit, but sacrifices himself for our benefit. And verse 5 continues, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He cannot be bribed. He cannot be bribed. A bribe would mean that Christ would be tempted to sin, and he can't be. That brings us back full circle to the impeccability of Christ. James 1 and verse 13 speaks on this. He says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he is not tempted with evil. There's nothing, there's no shadow of turning with the Lord and his purity. And so this is the Lord that we have for our Redeemer. This is the Lord that we had hanging upon the cross as our sacrifice. And, and this Lord that we see before us, we will spend eternity living in his glory forever and ever. Amen. And I hope we have time just very briefly to see our third point. So firstly, we saw the eternal question. Secondly, the description of Christ. And third, the characterization of the redeemed. The characterization of the redeemed. Because although we've seen Christ in here very clearly, it speaks also of the redeemed of the Lord. And the redeemed of the Lord are by the rebirth and by the sanctifying work of the Holy Ghost, as I mentioned in the introduction, or earlier on at least, are to be remade in Christ's image. Uh, and such a work is not an external religious work. These things are not just a list of rules that we're to tick off as if we were legalists, but it is a supernatural work of the Holy Ghost in the inward parts. And then that is then reflected in the outward behavior of the believer. In other words, the Lord has come to this fruitless and rotten and wicked tree, has performed a miracle within the tree. There is new life where there was no sap. There is now sap where there was no life. There is now life. And what do we see in that tree? Fruit begins to appear. Good fruit. So we see, therefore, there is firstly to be truth in the inward parts that we see when we see that he walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. Truth in the inward parts, that there is to be a true righteousness and a desire for righteousness. Behold, Psalm 51 and verse 6 says, Thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And that's what the work, work of the Lord is. Not an outward religion. Not on outward rules and outward impressions. But on the work on the inside. Because anybody and everybody does put on a show. A religious mask. A social mask. All sorts of masks that we can have. And we can look so pious. We can look so well behaved. Look at the politicians. Politicians know how to put on a show. Entertainers know how to put on a show, literally and figuratively. We all know how to put on a show. We're in a bad mood, and yet someone comes to the door, and there's a smile on our face. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're hypocrites. It's just that you can't bring a stranger who's bringing an Amazon parcel into your argument. It would, wouldn't be very good. And it wouldn't be applicable. So we all have a mask and we, and we need them. We can't pour out our heart in front of everybody. We can't go to the cashier in no frills and she says, how are you doing today? And then you break down and crying in front of them, of her for 10 minutes. But what we're considering here is that anybody, and they do, Many sinners, if they're in a false religion like Islam, or they profess no religion like an atheist, although atheism is their religion, they can have all these outward masks and they can appear so 
so good on the outside, and people can in the church, can appear so good. They've got, as we would say, they've got their Sunday best on. Uh, they're going to church. The, the, they seem to, they, they pray like you think a Christian would pray. They behave in the church. You think like a Christian should behave, and yet there is no fruit. And again, not because they're perfect, but because there is no fruit. There is no mercy. There is no humility. There is no love. Truth in the inward parts. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. And then secondly, we see, and speaketh the truth in his heart. I'm sorry, he that speaketh the truth in his heart belongs to that first point. And, and verse 3 says, He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up approach, reproach against his neighbor. Again, so one of the first fruits that you have of a changed heart is the mouth, the lips. Um, Paul speaks about it in Romans 10. He talks about the confession of what's in the heart is upon the lips. You confess with your mouth. And so the fruits, the one of the first fruits you get is in the mouth. And whether the, what do the words of the mouth come from? They come from our thoughts. They come from our desires, our emotions. And so they reveal very quickly what is within. And so we are not to be backbiters. We're not to be gossips. We're not to be cynics. We're not to be condescending. Because that really is one of the betrayers of false religion. They, they look like Christians, they walk like Christians, they, they dress like Christians, they smell like Christians. But that mouth, the things that they say, a Christian shouldn't be gossiping, a Christian shouldn't be slandering, a Christian shouldn't be backbiting. And that's the, how you know, that's how you discern, and that's how we are also to be. We are not to backbite. We are not to do those things. And the only way we can do those things that is not backbite, that is speaking in words of encouragement, uh, words of compassion, words of love, words of humility, the only way we're able to do these things is because we've been changed on the inside. It is true that there are strict religions. We can think of the Hasidim, the Hasidic Jews. We can think of maybe um, some of the, the, the uh, Hutterites and the like, and they have 50,000 rules for this, that, and the other. And someone can be brought up in those rules, and they know how to behave, and they, they know the words to use that, to appear very humble. And that makes it very hard for discernment when you're trying to discern, and you do have to discern. Not judge, but discern. But for them then, then they have to come to this word and say, well, there is backbiting. There is evil. I just have it under control. Well, that might say something of the, of the wicked nature of, of, of sinful man. But we're not to backbite at all. He that backbiteth not, nor doeth evil, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. And so we secondly see the desire that the door of the lips would be kept clean. Psalm 141 and verse 3, Set a watch, a guard, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. James spends quite a while speaking about the lips. And how can the same lips sit in church to praise God and then after the service, whisper curses towards man. How can a sweet well have bitter water? My brethren, this should not be so. So truth in the inward parts, keeping the door of our lips, a righteous love and hatred we see in verse uh, 4, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, that is despised, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. So this is a righteous despising, a righteous hatred of those that hate God and hate God's ways. That doesn't mean you don't pray for them, doesn't mean you don't speak to them, doesn't mean you don't rebuke them. But in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. 
Psalm 139 has this. In fact, there are quite a number of Psalms that speak this, and there's a few of the verses that we've already looked at in our study of the Psalms that tell us the same thing. But Psalm 139 and verse 21 says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? This is the, the same doctrine just on the other side of the coin to what John teaches us so often in his first epistle. Do I not love them, Lord, that love thee? How do we know that we're of the Lord? How do we know that the Lord is our Savior? How do we know that we've repented? How do we know that we savingly believe because we have a love toward the brethren that we never had before? And that love grows and we have a desire to love them and to receive their love and to have fellowship with them. So there is a righteous love and a, and a righteous hatred that we see. And fourthly, promise keeping. Promise keeping. That we say what we do and we will keep it. That we will not treat our word as lightly as the world does. That you will keep your promise and but if it doesn't work out, then, well, you know, sorry, circumstances have changed and I, I can't keep it anymore. But that's exactly what we read here, is he that sweareth to his own hurt. So you promise that you will lend the money and, and they're relying upon you and then it comes to lend that money. And at that particular moment, it's going to be very difficult. But you've, you've, made, you've, kept, you've made a promise and you're going to keep your promise. You will lend that money even though you have to have to sell something, you have to hold back on, have to cancel your, your booked vacation or whatever it is. But you'll keep your word as Christ keeps his word. Also not profit from others' poverty. He that putteth not out his money to usury. What's usury? Usury <clears throat> doesn't just mean taking interest on a money loaned or anything that's loaned uh, many things can be lent uh, we read in the scriptures you can lend somebody a tool but then you would demand that tool back and and, and some payment something for it <coughs> but we're not talking the lord is not against on but this is more pointed to where you will demand that, that somebody would pay you who cannot pay you it is an unrighteous charging of interest on a loan. Exodus 22 and 25, in those, ver in those chapters after the Ten Commandments that apply the Ten Commandments, if thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. Well, you're not going to take advantage of the poor, you're not going to profit from the poor but you will be merciful to them. Unbribable as well, and uh, we see that in Exodus 23 and verse 8. Again, those chapters after the Ten Commandments, and it says, And thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. Christ is unbribable. He would have his people to be unbribable because bribe, what is a bribe? Bribe buys your righteousness a bribe buys your character and you shouldn't be for sale in that way your honesty your integrity your christian witness should not be for sale ever and therefore we are to be absolutely unbribable which means we must be resilient against blackmail because that's linked to bribery which means that we are to walk very carefully lest anyone would take advantage of weakness and blackmail you. But we are to be unbribable. Let your yes be yes and your no be no and let truth be in the inward parts. And then finally, the eternal reward of grace we see in the final sentence of verse 5. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. There we have that glorious truth, that glorious promise. Christ will never be moved. He does these things, has done them, and on our behalf did them and died for us so that we would be the recipients of his grace without usury. We could even, we, there are more layers that would bring in Christ 
as we look at these things. But those that do these things shall never be moved. They will be fixed. They will have an eternal future that is fixed and sure. Their hope is sure and steadfast. Lord, my heart is fixed. It's fixed upon Christ by God's grace and God's work. He that does these things shall never be moved. Those that by God's grace have been enabled to walk uprightly and all those things that we've been considering together. Not that we are perfect in them, but we are bearing the fruit of them. Maybe not much fruit, but some fruit as evidence that you shall never be moved. Because Christ has done that work and he said it is finished. And he says also that all that come to him, he will in no wise cast out. And that he holds them in an eternal and merciful hand, his own and that of his own father. The eternal reward of grace. Isn't that wonderful? Is that the Lord comes and he does that miracle of the rebirth within you. He gives you his spirit and his grace that you would be less sinful and a little bit more like Christ. He has works planned from before the foundation of the world that will do you good and bring him glory. And then when he brings you to glory, he rewards you for the works that he made you do and helped you do. And the eternal reward of grace. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. And may God bless this psalm uh, to you and to your heart this evening. Uh, before we close in prayer, let us sing from hymn 400. Hymn 400. Hymn 400. Um, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are, my glorious dress, midst flaming worlds, in these arrayed, with joy shall I lift up my head. Psalm
be seated. Let us just close the time of our Bible study and prayer before we move on to our prayer time. Let us pray. Thou merciful and loving and glorious Lord and Savior, we do thank thee for thy word and the picture of Christ that we saw. Oh, we thank thee for his glorious perfections, for his goodness, for his kindness and his mercy, his purity and his holiness, his glorious example, and that this was the Lamb of God, the pure and spotless Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. We thank Thee, O Father, for Thy Son, whom Thou didst give, didst send, to be a propitiation that all that would believe in Him should not perish, but have that unmovable everlasting life in Christ. We thank Thee for this picture of Christ, for these words of exaltation to us who by grace may say that we belong to Christ, that we have been bought at a costly price, His precious blood. We pray for grace, O Lord, to consider these matters, to consider the glories of Christ, and to consider our responsibilities, our duties before Christ, to live like Him and to live for Him. Forgive the weakness of our soul. Forgive, O oh God, the strength of the flesh. And may it by Thy grace be otherwise. May we be strong in our soul. May the flesh be mortified. May our love for Christ grow more and more. And may his word redound to his glory even in our lives. Lord, help us in the time of prayer we plead with thee. We need thy help. For Jesus' sake, amen.